Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jacobs Teen Innovation Challenge. I'm so excited that you're all here joining us today. Um, I know we have friends who are, are joining the challenge who are unable to make it today, so we are recording for their benefit and for yours if you like. Um, and with that, we're just going to jump right into it because we've got a lot of stuff to do today, and we want to make sure we have an opportunity to answer any questions and, and continue the conversation. So next slide. Fundamentally, the reason that we're here is that we believe teenagers can build a better world when provided the right tools and access to innovation culture. We hope that you join us in that belief. That's what we're trying to do. We're going to start with teenagers because they're the future. Next. I am Monty Kalish. I am the director of technology um, and one of the co-inventors of Packbull. I work with the Jacobs Institute for Innovation in Education at the University of San Diego. We are a nonprofit R&D institute that helps power K through 20 inclusive innovation. We have a number of folks on our team, but this is the team that primarily focuses on Packbull related events. And this event is really um, to support Packbull and our work in trying to help uh, change the world with teenagers. So I'll let uh, Alina and Lynn introduce themselves and then we'll move forward. Hi everyone, I'm Alina Mitchell. I'm the Associate Director of Academic Innovation and Technology. I provide a lot of the teacher support for Packful. I'm a former teacher myself and former principal and I'm just excited to be here with all of you this evening. Lynn, you're muted. I'm Lynn Lear, and uh, I am a fellow with the Jacobs Institute, and uh, I, I am working with this wonderful group of people. I, too, am a former teacher and a former principal, uh, and so I'm here to help in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you, Lena and Lynn. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a couple of other members of our core team who are unable to be with us today, including Lisa Dolly, who is our executive director, um, and uh, you know, Dr. Yaren Lee, who is our managing researcher and data science uh, scientist. Um, she helps us with all kinds of uh, research oriented elements and ultimately will help pave the, the path for us to understand how the work that we're doing here can play out from a research perspective. By way of background, um, I did mention I'm the director of technology, but I have a long background in education. Um, I spent 15 years as the chief technology officer for Connections Education, which is now owned by Pearson, but is one of the large the two large national providers of virtual K through 12 education. This was before K-12, this was before virtual school was something everyone was doing, <laughs> unlike this year. Um, moving forward, uh, next slide. So what is the Teen Innovation Challenge? Um, ultimately, you're here to help us with this plan. Um, we are offering, this is the second time we've done this, we've tweaked the name a little bit, um, tweaked a few things, but it's really an opportunity to uh, bring design thinking uh, mentality and innovation skills to teenagers and help them learn how to become social good innovators and help create help solve create solutions to local and global problems so you will see throughout the work that we do we align our work and the work that they're doing to the UN global goals we help teach design thinking as a process um, but ultimately it's not really about the process or the mechanism it's about the mindset that we hope that they can develop and we hope that you here along that journey can help us with that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Alina for, to introduce our wonderful speaker. Yes, I'm so excited this evening. We have with us Dr. Jennifer Williams as our, our special guest speaker. And I wanna share with you a little bit about her background. Um, as many of you know, she is the author um, of the book, Teach Boldly Using EdTech for Social Good. Uh, she has over 25 years of experience in the educational field and is currently a professor at St. Leo University. And she is also the co-founder of Teach SDGs, um, which is really important because the Sustainable Development Goals tie right into Packful. And that's one of the reasons why, um, there's many reasons, but that's one of the reasons why we asked her to come and join us this evening. Uh, Dr. Williams is the president of the ISTE Education Leaders PLN Board of Directors and serves as a consultant for Adobe for Education in Patico and the U.S. Department of State. 
She has received notable recognition for her work as a transformational leader in education. And uh, Dr. Williams, we are just so happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Alina, and to Monty and the entire team for having me. And so great to see so many educators joining in for this challenge. It's incredible to see, especially as Monty said, during these interesting times to uh, see teachers taking on more, but something so important like this challenge, which I think gets really at the heart of action and social good for our classrooms, which is definitely something that is needed right now. So Alina and I've been talking for a while as you all are preparing for this kickoff celebration. So I'm really honored to be here with you as you begin this special journey with this challenge. And I'll be closely following everything you all are doing. Of course, uh, I'd love to be a resource as you all uh, go through this challenge. Anything you need from the Teach SDG side, we'll be talking a little bit about teach boldly. So as you're, you're learning with your students and creating, definitely please keep me posted on anything I can do. But Alina and I were talking on, so I, I have just about 20 minutes with you all tonight, so not too much time, but just what we could do to share uh, that would be most beneficial to you all as you're setting out on this journey. So I've prepared a little bit on just the, the track I took to get to being a part of the SDGs and education and using EdTech for social good. But mainly I want to leave you with some practical tips and some practices and tools that I really love using in my global collaboration projects that I'm part of with uh, Teach SDGs and our work with Take Action Global. So I think Alina has given me slide share privileges. So I'm gonna share my whole desktop because I'm gonna switch between a couple browsers, but I'm gonna start here. And so I'm gonna share to tonight um, all of the information that you'll see here on the screen. So I'll share my slides, I'll share links to all of the different resources, and hopefully we'll have time to test a few out. So as Lena mentioned, my name is Dr. Jennifer Williams, and you can find me on Twitter at jenwilliamsedu. Also, my website is jenwilliamsedu.com. So anything that I share today also will be on my website. I've shared a few of my favorite hashtags because I love anything around hashtags and social media. Let me move this so I can see everything. And the first one is Teach SDGs. And it's great to talk to you all because you all are already familiar with the global goals. But a lot of people that I work with have never even heard of the goals. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, them and, and my journey and um, really getting to know them closely. Also, Teach Boldly is another one of my favorite hashtags, of course, because of that concept of teaching boldly, but also the title of my book, and then Take Action EDU. So as well as finding me on Twitter and Instagram, I also tweet a lot with those hashtags. So for tonight, you're going to need, um, or it's probably not night for most of you, but for me it is, you're gonna need one piece of plain paper. And so it can be lined, it can be blank, um, just something that you'll be able to write on and write with. And I'm gonna show you one of my favorite activities within design thinking, and that's it. So um, if you have that handy, that would be great, but we won't need that for a little bit. So kind of starting with my journey on, um, with SDGs and with education. So I started off on the science side of education as a speech language pathologist and then moved into a role as a reading specialist and then classroom teacher, then school principal. The last school I was at was a Montessori world school. We were in this very utopic environment. We were on 14 acres of land here in Florida. We had cows and horses and llamas and chickens and horseback riding for PE. We had an organic garden where we were growing our food um, for lunch. We prioritized the peace curriculum, geography, cultural studies, just like we would with science and math and ELA. And within Montessori is when I really started to view education different. Um, this idea of global citizenship, which was part of our school mission. And also we were early adopters with, with technology. So we were using iPads about 2010, around the time when they came out for schools. 
and trying to find ways to use them purposefully with our students. So we were connecting with classrooms from around the world, uh, which was tricky back then, not like today where we can just jump on Twitter and find a classroom and, and especially now um, that we're, everyone is online. So we were figuring it out. We were making tons of mistakes, um, but that really is what I feel uh, prepared me for going out and starting to do global collaboration work more broadly. So you'll see here, these are four pillars offered by the Asia Society around global competence. So I've been using them for a long time, still use them today. If you're not familiar with the work of the Asia Society and you're interested in global education, I would definitely recommend checking them out. And so I was using this framework with our students. So we had students as young as age one, all the way up through grade eight. And I felt like we were doing a pretty good job checking these boxes, having our students investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas. I felt like we were talking about different cultures and customs and clothing and food, but I really started to understand this last piece of take action, which is what for me is it's all about. And though we were doing a lot of the, the work in these other three areas, Take action was an area that I needed to do a lot of work um, personally. So now I, I pretty much dedicate all of my work to this final area of take action and supporting teachers and students uh, in their journeys. So I left K-12 in 2014 to move to higher ed. I had just come out of you know, this program where we were tech infused, where we were able to do you know, travel abroad and our students were quite passionate about the work they were doing. So for me, this is it. So I, I laughed and said, um, as I'm doing work in higher ed, how can I also um, help other classrooms and schools in their journey? And I found that a lot of teachers at that time said, that's great, happy someone's doing that, but that's a nice to have. I have a lot bigger problems around classroom management and parent needs and standardized tests. So that's not really something that I see myself working on. So continued to do that. And then in 2015, I'd been doing work with the UN and the Millennium Development Goals, these SDGs, these global goals as we now know, 17 goals that we as a world uh, came together and agreed upon to reach by the year 2030. And all of a sudden, this was that tipping point where I started to see teachers really see themselves in this work. And when they saw those goals and said, well, we are doing things like life on land and life underwater and partnerships and no poverty. Those are things teachers have been doing forever. We've always been doing that type of work. So they started to see themselves in the goals and we started to try to find ways to bring the goals to classrooms. Fast forward, um, uh, I was at a global, uh, global education forum in Philadelphia and with a fellow global educator, Ada McKim from Canada, and we said, who's doing this work? Who's bringing the SDGs to classrooms? Because we feel like this could really be the roadmap for um, sustainable change. And we couldn't figure it out at the time. We sent a tweet. The United Nations answered, we started to do work with them, and we moved from being two to four to 17 educators to now over 50,000 teachers around the world who are working to bring the SDGs to classrooms. So we still continue to just exist as a, a movement. We're not organized as a structured nonprofit because we really believe that just like the SDGs belong to every person on this planet, Teach SDGs belongs to every teacher and student. So we just work to keep that, that movement going. And so for me, um, and then I also have my nonprofit organization, Take Action Global, where we're, we're trying to move classrooms through this progression of exactly what you all are going to be doing with this challenge. And we're seeing a lot of really great things. I just came off of ISTE and we're talking about creation, which is this wonderful, progression from consumption to now creation, but how can we inspire our students to create with purpose and to take action in a way that can make change in a world as they prepare for their futures, which is exactly what you all are getting prepared to do. So I like to always point out too, so a lot of the teachers I work with when 
I start to have conversations around social good. They're not quite sure where that fits in with them in their instructional practice. And for good reason, because as educators in our pre-service teacher programs, we aren't really prepared for this because social good mostly reserved for the profession of social work. So looking to social work for a strong definition of social good, services or products that promote human well-being on a large scale. Well, of course, as teachers, this is us. This is what we work for. We have these three anchor themes offered by social work as well, which really I think as I, I think what I'm trying to um, place my focus in practice within uh, taking action for social good, I think this really sums it up. So environmental justice and sustainability, social inclusion, peace, harmony, and collaboration. And I think 2020 has really brought these um, definitely into focus, not only in classrooms, but our entire world. So this is the right time. This is the moment, I think, really such an exciting time for us in education. So the SDGs, um, this is my roadmap, this is my framework. Uh, as you all are close to these goals, you know that we have our own goal in quality education for all, number four, but I believe every goal is part of um, instruction. I, I think, kind of think of them, people often will have conversations with me, what's your favorite goal? And it's like, as a teacher, I kind of think of um, these all your students in your classroom, like how can you pick a favorite? They're all so important and work together like a puzzle, but I'm also quite close to SDG 17, which is partnerships for the goals. And I almost kind of think of that as the teacher goal in that classroom of SDGs. So, and what I find is um, when you kind of put it out there and give this menu of offerings to your students, they're going to be drawn to one. Um, just, and it might change over time too. So it's really interesting to see. So as part of my work, um, Teach SDGs, this is our, our movement around the, the global goals. So much has happened since 2015. We really started as an organization just about awareness. How can we bring awareness to classrooms that these goals exist and that they belong to teachers and that they can use them? We then evolved into after teachers knew that they were there, they were ready for the how. How can I bring these goals to my classroom? So we have the annual Global Goals Project that will kick off in January. Of course, you all are welcome to participate in that. I do a lot of instructional design and collaboration with, with World's Largest Lesson. If you haven't checked them out, they're fantastic. And then of course, Take Action Global, where we just finished up the Climate Action Project. I don't know if anyone here participated in that, but we had uh, over 2 million students around the world working together for six weeks all around climate change. So it was pretty cool to see. Here's one of our classrooms in uh, Tanzania. So we have partnered with Jane Goodall Institute. This is a group of students who are working on their own design thinking project. That might be something for you all. Um, if you're interested in connecting with them, they meet every Saturday. And so we do all the teacher training for them. We also opened our first school in the Kakuma refugee camp in February. Unfortunately, it had to be closed down two weeks later, but we're hoping to get that back going just as soon as we can. The goals project, these are some, um, if you're looking for inspiration as you're working through your uh, teen innovation challenge, you can check out the goals project projects and they're all there. We have students as young as age three, all the way up through university sharing their projects. So that could serve as some inspiration for your students as they're working. Okay, so so that's kind of where uh, I've been, where I'm heading, what I'm working on. And so I wanted to definitely get to share some practical tools and practices that I find really come in handy when you're working through these design thinking projects. And so I work through the human-centered design framework. Um, a, lot of, a lot of groups work through the five-phase design thinking process. Um, I know you all have, um, have a process you're going to be working through with four phases um, similar to this with understand, ideate, prototype, and pitch. And I think of them um, very similarly to inspiration, ideation, and implementation, which is the three-phase approach to problem solving that I typically use in instructional design. So you might want to check out IDEO and they have some great activities that you can do with students as they're working through the process. And I think those uh, phases align real nicely. 
So the first thing I wanted to share, a practice I call three good things. Now this um, is a practice, it's super simple. You basically need zero resources. You just need um, space and time to have conversations with your students around three good things. And this comes from the University of Pennsylvania and the Positive Psychology Center. So basically it's an exercise in happiness. And when I do this with students, I find out so much about them and about what they're passionate about, which is great when you're in that inspiration phase and trying to um, think through where you're going to head next with their design thinking process. So basically how you would do it is you would ask them, tell me three good things that happened today. Oftentimes you might want to have your students write these three good things down. Um, you could have them, if you're in person, you could have them write those three good things on sticky notes. That becomes then their anchor item that they can speak from. And um, I did this with, uh, if you know Liv Bitts, she's, she's a, a student activist. She does great work around reading. And the other day she was telling me about three great things she loves. And one was, we were talking about sharks. One was books and the other was strawberry Pop-Tarts. So now, in just one minute, I learned so much about Liv and what makes her tick. So three good things, something you can do with your students. So I wanted to test this out with you today. If you are in virtual environments, um, you can use, well, there's so many different tools. The one I like to use is called Mentimeter. And I was just going to show you, if you haven't used Mentimeter, hopefully you can still see my screen, and you go to mentimeter.com. And so if this is the teacher view, I'm going to make, I have a, a free account, and I'm going to make a new presentation, and I'm going to call it Three Good Things. And Jacobs, just so we make sure I keep that for you all. And then we're going to get to this screen and it's going to give us some options of what type of question do we want to ask multiple choice word cloud open ended. I really like using ranking and scales. So today we're going to use word cloud and I am going to say what is one good thing that happened today. Okay, and that's it. And then I'm going to present it. Here we are. So if you have a mobile device, you can grab it and you're gonna go to menti.com and then when you're at menti, you're gonna enter the code. All right. And the code is 29749844. You should see that at the top of my screen. And then when you're on there, so two, nine, seven, four, nine, eight, four, submit. All right, what is one good thing that happened today? And I'm gonna say for me, it's the kickoff. And then you're gonna start to see those um, populate on this screen. So you can quickly, um, if you're in a virtual environment or if you are together with your students, you can start to see um, what are some good things that happened today. So bringing focus to well-being, positivity, and joy, which I think is a great way to start your uh, design thinking process. So lots of, <laughs> lots of really good things that happened today. So this could be an opportunity for discussion, for feedback, um, I know probably a lot of you have been using word clouds for a long time, but really to visualize positivity grow can be an uplifting activity for, um, for anyone really. So, okay, so that's menti.com. I'm gonna get back here and keep going just to make sure we don't run out of time. Okay, so um, another one I wanted to show you is called the five whys. And this is another free, you don't need any resources. This is just a questioning activity that you can do with your students in the iteration phase as you're trying to get um, deeper with their responses. So I'll read through it really quickly. Um, but basically what you're gonna be doing is taking a response and turning it into a, a why question five times. So in the story of the three little pigs, why did the third pig build a house of bricks? The response, because she wanted to have a strong house. 
So we could stop there because that's actually an accurate response. That answer is correct. And we could move on. But what if we want to learn more? But why did the third pig want to have a strong house? Because she knew the wolf would try to blow it down. Well, but why did she think the wolf would try to blow it down? Well, because the wolf blew down the house of straw and the house of sticks. But why did the wolf blow down the house of straw and the house of sticks? Because he wanted to get to the three pigs. And finally, but why did the wolf want to get to the three pigs? Well, because he wanted to eat the pigs. So we see differences with response one. Of course, that pig wanted to have a strong house, but motivation really was on survival. This pig wanted to live and didn't want to get eaten by the wolf. So trying the five whys, this is great for the inspiration phase, which for you all will be that understanding phase also as you're working in ideation. Okay, um, I'm quickly gonna share, and we won't test this one out just because of time, but uh, if you do sticky notes in your classroom, which is a great activity as part of design thinking, in person, uh, wonderful to use. A little trickier when you're trying to work collaboratively in online spaces. My favorite tool to use here is called Sticky's IO. This is a screen capture, um, but I'll, this is actually the true board here. And you can see that um, this was, I have a group of interns that are working all around the world. And so we were building out one of our projects. And so we were adding ideas. You can see you can upvote, which is another design thinking activity. You can upvote the different ideas. You can change the colors. You can, um, you can group them according to likeness. So there's a lot of things that you can do with Sticky's IO. I also like to use Padlet, um, but this has a little bit different functionality that I find useful in design thinking. Okay, and my final one today, even though I have more in the, um, the, the presentation that you can check out, but this was one I wanted to show you because if there's one you try, this is my very favorite one before I turn it back over to you, Alina. And this is called Card Sorts. So if you take that piece of paper, let me see. I don't know if you can see me. Maybe I'm gonna go off of screen share so you can see me full screen. Okay, so if you take that piece of paper and you take your pen and you're gonna divide the paper into four quadrants and messy is actually advised. So you don't wanna make that process too long. You could also use four note cards. Um, but I actually like the process that I'm going to show you of ripping and tearing because it's good for building fine motor, also good for um, building ownership over the ideas. So I have my four quadrants. Now I'm going to tear them into four equally sized pieces. One, two, three, four. You're probably going to take about 20 minutes for this activity. I'm going to do it in like one minute, but just to show you. Now on each of these pieces of paper, I'm gonna add one single idea. For us, I'm gonna talk um, about the four areas of literacy. So on one piece of paper, I'm going to write listening. On one piece of paper, I'm going to write speaking. Then reading, and of course writing. So we go through this process. This can be anything, any type of choice you want your students to think on. And so here's where the next part, um, this is where it gets interesting. So I have my four pieces of paper. Each one has one idea. So here's where you would look to your students and say, now what I'd like you to do is put them in order. Probably they're gonna look up at you and be very confused because they're quite used to being told what order things should be in, ABC order, preference, whatever it is. All you say is put them in order. So um, you all are teachers, very familiar with literacy practices. So you're gonna put them in an order that feels right for you. And I know for me, um, I feel most comfortable with this order, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Now I, as a teacher wouldn't say that to them, but I might call on them. Who's interested in sharing their ideas? If we had time tonight, you'd be able to share your ideas. All of them are correct. All of them have meaning for you. You've already gone through a thinking process to put them in that order. So you've done self-talk. And so I, I believe listening first, because as a baby, you would first listen and then you would speak and you could speak to those. So this is gonna help them as they're thinking through that um, ideation phase 
of uh, making choice on how they're going to move forward. So that's card sorts, uh, another one of my favorites. All right, so um, I think I'm about at time, and I know that Alina has, uh, Mary who's gonna be speaking on Teach Boldly, and I think that some of you are gonna be checking out that book as you're moving through your process of the Innovation Challenge. Please keep me posted if you have any questions. I've also prepared that digital toolkit that Alina has uh, let me know that she's gonna share with you all that has information on the whole slide decks in there all of my contact information, but I'm thrilled that you are setting off for this adventure and I hope you keep me posted and thank you again for welcoming me in here tonight. Wonderful, thank you so much for all of those wonderful e-learning tools. That was, those are awesome. <laughs> I know I will personally be using Minty. Oh, good. <laughs> But thank you so much for sharing with us your journey, uh, you know, moving from a tweet to the United Nations. I mean, that's just amazing. And uh, we appreciate, you know, all of the innovation uh, that you, you know, have shared with us this evening. I know that, you know, all of us who are here are innovative educators and, uh, but it's just always wonderful to hear what other people are doing and to know just how big you know your ideas can really grow like i said from a tweet to the united nations that's amazing <laughs> um, as you mentioned uh dr williams we have a virtual book signing opportunity um, for you this evening we have with us mary meyer who is the business De um, development manager at barnes and noble and she's a very active leader in the San Diego community. And she's gonna tell us a little bit more about that uh, amazing opportunity. And you know, who would have thought we had to do virtual book signings nowadays, <laughs> but of course due to COVID, we've had to revamp the way we approach things. And so we're really excited to have this opportunity. So Mary, I would like to invite you to, uh, to speak to everyone. All right, hi everyone. As Alina said, my name is Mary Meyer and I work for Barnes and Noble across the San Diego region. And so I've been very lucky to be able to partner with the Jacobs Institute over the past year or so on, on some of their educational initiatives. And I'm very excited to be able to work through Pactful too. Um, so if we were meeting in person today, we would have an in-person signing, like Alina was saying, and a celebration for Jen's book. But obviously we still want to celebrate the book. And since we are virtual, we thought it would be fun to do a virtual version of this. So basically how it will work is that after the event, Alina will send out a Google form um, so that you can choose to purchase Jen's phenomenal book at a 25% Pactful discount. And when you purchase the book, you will also be receiving some swag courtesy of Jen, which will include an autographed sticker that you can put in the book and also a Teach Boldly bookmark and pin as part of the package. So we're excited about that. Um, as Jen mentioned, she has the toolkit so that um, she has great resources that align exactly with the book uh, so we'll make sure that you receive that to go along with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the Pactful team and I uh, co-curated a book list around the SDGs and the Pactful program that may be of interest to uh, middle school students, high school students, and educators and of course Jen's book is included on that list as well. Um, that list is on the Pactful website and a link to it will also be on the Google form that comes out to you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me about anything. I'm happy to help with recommendations. I'm really excited uh, to help promote Jen's book. Um, I just started reading it and already am so engaged in it. So thank you, Jen. Um, and I just also wanted to thank all of you so much uh, for the work that you're doing. Um, in this time, you know, so much has felt like it's at a standstill and like it's in disarray. And so I think it's even more important and necessary um, to find community and to also lead through social good and innovation like you all will be doing. So thank you. I really look forward to seeing everything that will come out of the Pactful projects. Thank you so much, Mary. And once again, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your wonderful presentation. And I would like to let you know that we will be randomly selecting two of tonight's virtual attendees to receive complimentary copies of Dr. Williams' book. So when you get that follow-up email, check to see if you're a winner. <laughs> Moving forward, um, it's always important for us to uh, to share with you the foundation of Pactful, like the, the problem that Pactful is addressing. And we want to talk a little bit about uh, innovation and what it looks like. Uh, if you notice on this uh, chart here, you 
can see that where you grow up determines your uh, likelihood of being exposed to innovation culture. If you look at the darker blue areas, those represent where innovation happens the most. And some of your light blue and white areas are where um, there still needs to be some work. And uh, I'm from Georgia, and as I look over my home state, I see that there's, a, there's some innovation happening, but there's a lot of work to do. If you take a look at the uh, rate of innovation, uh, you will notice that uh, your family's wealth actually affects that. As we see on this chart, your chances of inventing rise as your parent income rises, with those in the top 1% of wealth being 10 times more likely to develop patents than those that live in poverty. When we look at innovation by gender, uh, we notice that we have a very small percentage of females um, who are being represented in this area. And women founders only receive 2% of venture capital funding. Now, this is gradually shrinking over time, but at the current rate, it would take about 118 years to reach gender parity. If we take a look at innovators by race, um, we will notice that um, when you take a look at black and brown communities, they are um, much lower than their counterparts. So there's some work that needs to be done there as well. And I know this is a global challenge and we have a lot of uh, participants this, this go round who are from other countries and which we're so excited about. Um, but when we take a look at this map here, um, this comes from the Global Innovation Index you can see that where you live in the world actually affects your likelihood to innovate. And from the white areas on the map, you can see that we have a ways to go to ensure innovation is accessible to everyone across the globe. And these, um, this is, this, excuse me, statistics <laughs> up until the global index um, actually come from, a, um, come from two Stanford economists, Bell and Chetty. And they, um, they estimate that, um, that in order for us to, um, to address this, in order to um, quadruple the rate of innovation, that we have to really address these, these areas because ultimately our economy is, is just at a big loss. And so Monty is gonna tell us a little bit more about our solution and how Pactful, how the curriculum actually addresses these areas. Thank you, Alina. Um, so ultimately, we looked at this data and research and information and said, what if a sort of platform and a solution existed to help these underrepresented populations gain access to innovation culture? How could that help us all over the long term? And that's what actually drove us to create Pactful. So Pactful is a combination of a curriculum and tech platform um, that helps foster this, this social good innovation among students. And we started with teenagers. Um, we're trying to help them you know, driving home Dr. Williams' point too, to become social good innovators, to solve local and global problems aligned to the UN global goals, and to really practice design thinking and develop that innovator's mindset. So I'm gonna introduce um, one, this is a short little video, and kind of give you a quick overview of the curriculum and platform and on our intent. So go ahead and hit play if you would. Anyone can be a social innovator. Social innovation is all about people around the world working together to solve local and global problems. In 2015, the United Nations agreed to make the world a better place by establishing 17 global goals. These goals offer a framework to address large social challenges such as poverty, hunger, and climate change. Here, you'll develop an innovator's mindset to tackle any challenge and create solutions aligned to the global goal. These solutions could be something as small as how to handle food waste at home, or as large as how to provide clean drinking water to anyone in your city. To make the world a better place, it takes people like you working in teams. 
Using the design thinking process, you'll identify issues, brainstorm ideas, and prototype incredible new solutions to problems that affect us. Your team will work through three phases of design thinking, understand, ideate, and prototype to create a solution for a local or global issue. When complete, you'll also develop a pitch to share your work with a larger audience. Have you ever realized that everything in the world is designed, but not all designs are good? With an innovator's mindset and design thinking, you will redesign the world and make it a better place. Get ready to become a bold and powerful innovator. Throughout this process, for we know I'm so fortunate and so thankful to see some familiar faces on this uh, webinar who have been through, you uh, either used Packer before or participated in our challenges, but it was also a bunch of new, um, new joiners and we are so thankful for that as well. I, I will say, if you are new to this, you've been hearing a lot of terms and information today. We're going to walk you through this process. This is the first. This is the kickoff. Um, as we go forward through the challenge, which effectively really gets started in January, on January 14th, when we have a webinar to discuss the understand phase, we're trying to tee up conversations and information for you so that you can help your students along. So don't worry about all the information you're getting today. It's just meant to be a primer and an introduction um, with follow-up information. And that includes um, two pieces that we will send you after her today, or afterward today. The Innovator's Guide is a part of the Pactful app. It's intended for both students and teachers alike to be able to access sort of high level information about um, social good innovation, Pactful design thinking and the SDGs. And we also have a teacher's guide which we've created to kind of help teachers. It's in the innovators guide under the resources. It's available to anyone using the app because we're not hiding anything from students, but it does provide a little more context, some suggestions and ideas around activities you may wanna use in your classroom. So, I will send you information later today with all of the things you're hearing. One of those includes um, access to the teacher's guide, which you may want to take a look at before we reconvene in January. Next slide. And as I mentioned um, to Carl online, we are going to, um, <clears throat> we have a Pactful community. It's, it's, you can see the image at the bottom. It's linked in the, at the top of both the public website and the, and the Pactful app itself. Um, that's the place we're helping, we're trying to gather conversation and to bring everyone together and so Carl to your point we would love to have all of you join in the conversation online and start to communicate with each other we know from having done this last year that we've got some good ideas and some good thoughts but you're the experts you're the ones connected directly with students and we have you have a lot to share and learn from each other and I do hope we have some time for questions and conversation we may not have a lot of that today but we will in the future but we're also going to drive to the community online so I hope you'll join us in that as well the overall timeline for the challenge, as you can see here, today is the kickoff. This is just the starting point. We're going to reconvene on January 14th and talk about the first of the three design thinking phases and then leading up into the pitch. It's really this up when we get to January 14th, we will be talking about the understand phase in more detail, giving you some ideas about how to use the Pactful app, how to you know, use that information with your students, including the curricular components, and maybe some ideas and suggestions about activities. We're also lucky to have some guest speakers coming to our future webinars, including on January 14th, I'm so pleased to have one of our longtime partners and friends, Connie Liu, uh, who is the co-founder of Project Invent, will be joining us on January 14th. Ultimately, we are leading up into the May 1st pitch deadline. We'll talk about that more in the future, but that's the deadline that we'll be asking you to have completed and worked with your student teams and have identified and submitted a video pitch to our team um, for consideration in the final prizes. So that's the key date. The others are just sort of staggered along the way, opportunities for us to come back together and help you and help you help each other. Everything will be recorded and sent out and made available afterwards, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Next slide. I'm not going to go through all the details on the requirements. You probably saw this on our webpage, but I do want to point out a couple of things. We are trying to um, really understand the curricular components that we've pulled together and the Pactful app itself. And so one of the requirements is that um, because of COPA, we need students to be 13 years or older in order to join into the app. If you have 12-year-old students, that's okay as long as they are joining a team with a 13-year-old who can actually manage the, the work within the Pactful app. 
You don't have to worry about students signing in just yet. We'll get to that later. Um, and ultimately, each students who are participating will need to uh, work through the curriculum and submit their information into Pactful um, and work together on their team through the through the Pactful app and through the curriculum. That's really our key to kind of understand how effective things are working and what changes and tweaks we can make to make it better. Pactful will provide you an opportunity to have some management of the projects themselves as they evolve from initial conception and from students' minds into a solution. Ultimately, and I did say this before, and you can see this from our background, our goal here is to really truly increase access to innovation culture. And so we would encourage you to think about opportunities to um, help students have diversity in their teams. Um, that's something that's important to us and we'd like to help you with that in any way that we can. Now the fun part. Yes, the fun part. <laughs> well, of course, we all know that within this competition, everyone wins because we're taking steps to build a better world. However, in addition to that positive intrinsic, intrinsic award, we'll be taking on a new approach to our prizes this year. Uh, winning teams will learn the value of social responsibility by selecting a charity to make a contribution to on behalf of their team and the Jacobs Institute. And we'll talk a little bit more about this during future webinars, but um, as you can see here, you have all of the details. Um, and just, we're just really excited to take that charitable approach. Uh, we, just to let you know that winning teams will be announced, of course, on our website. We will send it through our distribution list and um, even media attention as well. So this is really, really big. Throughout the competition, it, as an incentive, we do give storyteller awards in the amount of $25. And this is really to um, encourage sharing on social media. Uh, we are on uh, Twitter, we're on Instagram, even Facebook. So you, you can choose any one of those social media outlets to just showcase the work that you and your students are doing. Uh, but definitely want to keep in mind that it's important to use the hashtag JTIC21, but we'll remind you, so don't worry about that. <laughs> now, here are uh, some examples of some of our previous Innovation Challenge winners. Uh, we had, oh, man, we had so many great ideas from our, from our participants. And, um, and even in spite of COVID, because COVID hit right um, as we were towards the end of, of our actual competition, but we were happy to see that a lot of the teams um, wanted to press on, they were excited to do so. And so here are some examples of our first, second, and third place winners. Uh, if you actually go on to the Packful website, you can read up a little bit more about them. But we're really proud and very excited. And we, since we have all of you who, as I mentioned before, are very innovative educators, uh, if you know of you know, any other teachers who you think might be interested in participating in this challenge, it's not too late to join. So please feel free to share the follow-up email that we're gonna send out with anyone that you think might be interested in this, because it's a really great opportunity for students and the skills that they're learning is something that they can apply, not just for now, but really for the rest of their lives. So please share. And, and I would actually add to that, some of you may know that we originally had a a priority deadline to sign up for November 20th. We have decided in the interest of trying to spread the word and continue to you know, foster this important skill to carry that um, open all the way until January 14th before we have our understand webinar. So we would ask interested other educators and folks to please go ahead and sign up and we will get them on the list, send them this recording and catch them up for anything to date. Um, we would really use your help. You're here today helping us make a difference. We're so excited by that, but we also hope that you will help us share this with others who might be interested. And I understand this is a difficult time for a lot of teachers. Um, so I really am appreciative of, of those of you who are able to tackle this this year. And we hope that we make it as easy as possible. Definitely, and just please know that we are here to support you. If you have any questions or, you know, just run into some, you know, hiccups along the way, we are here to, you know, walk you through and to support you. Through that. Um, that's why you know, we, do, we really do encourage you to attend the webinars because there's a lot of collaboration and idea sharing that happens amongst educators. And uh, you know, we have a lot of resources within the curriculum, 
but you know you just be amazed at how many more ideas there are out there or other resources and so other educators definitely bring that to the table i want to share with you one quote from one of our teachers that i think really um captures you know how tactful can really change the classroom and this comes from eric nielsen he stated that this is the kind of project that makes kids interested to come to school being so different and relevant, the kids bought in right away and did complex research and problem solving. And uh, we'll, it, we'll probably share this with you later on, but uh, some of the students were just really so excited. Uh, they you know, took it upon themselves to create their own Twitter a channel or Twitter account and post their uh, their project on there just to really start you know start a movement and so this could really you know students really take ownership of this work that they're doing and so we're really excited um, that you have you know committed your time and your students time to this um, because we think it's really going to be fun for them and at this time if you have any questions or comments, you can feel free to um, turn on your camera or just um, unmute yourself and ask it. Or if you feel more comfortable, right, typing it in the chat, that's fine too. But we'll take questions and comments. And I, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and answer one because I got a question from Blanca separately um, asking about um, what do we suggest for team sizes for students? And I would say the answer is, we typically um, would suggest somewhere between two and six students. I think the sweet spot is usually three or four. It, it could be, and it, you know, you're welcome to adjust that as, as you see fit in your classrooms, but that's kind of the area that we see the most success. Beyond six, I think it gets a little too much. And then, um, let's see here. Uh, Tina, will there be any training opportunities offered directly to students or does it all go through teachers? Our hope is to really engage directly with um, teachers and educators like you, and then to help you prepare and arm yourselves to be able to go and work with students. If there's an opportunity or a situation where you think that um, our team could help you and your students and further, please reach out and let us know. We're happy to talk about that. We want to help you be successful. But ultimately, our objective is to kind of work with you directly and help support you we try not to engage directly with students except from a support perspective as necess if necessary. Most of that goes through you and you communicate with them. Ooh, Stephanie, loaded question. How many minutes per week should we set aside for a packful curriculum? That seems like a great question that might go well on the, in the message boards and get some feedback. And I see some other people on here now who probably could chime in on that. We structured the timeline purposely to sort of allocate approximate amount of time, two, three, four weeks um, for each of the phases, the three phases of design thinking that we use, and then the one um, pitch phase. We kind of structured that out intentionally. We have some people who actually started the school year, you know, three months ago and are working on projects for the whole year that are participating in the challenge, so they're doing it longer. Others can compress it to an even shorter amount of time. I don't think there's a perfect answer for how exactly how much it really depends on your your individual situation. But that's a great question to probably jump in online and get other people's perspectives because we're not the only ones who have answers there. I see we have a question about student ambassadors that could support our students. We don't have we don't have student ambassadors just yet. We have talked about that, <laughs> and uh, you know, working or still brainstorming on how that could function. Um, however, uh, you know, if, if teachers, if you you know come to the webinars, you know, um, you know, we you know can definitely support you. If you find that there's uh, you know you know something that you, additional support that you need for your students, you know, just let us know and we can brainstorm and come up with the best way uh, to provide some student support for you. So we're open to that if, they, if you need that. And Torezi, I may be saying that wrong, I'm sorry. How does this differ from project problem-based learning? I don't know that it does. Um, this is exactly the kind of work that we do. We, we believe in, you know, we've created elements in the PACL program to help with student choice and autonomy. And that's all intentional for our way of thinking about things. And this is all project based. We want students to work in teams um, together. So, you know, really this, and there is alignment information from a curricular perspective, if that's what you're looking for on the website, or we can answer some of that too. There's lots of ways to integrate 
this into various types of classes with, um, or after school programs. I know we've got some Girl Scout, but we've got all kinds of different folks here, which is exciting. Um, and so we want to support different things. And I see there's a question about the composition and format of the pitch. Um, fortunately, in the curriculum in Packful, um, once you go into Packful, if you click on the pitch phase, uh, one of the uh, activities in there should be, um, you know, towards the, the latter end of it. <laughs> uh, we actually have a pitch rubric, and uh, so we, which um, it basically shares with you all of the information or the elements that we're looking for um, from each project. My question was, what does the panel look like in terms of composition and format? What, what, is, what is the structure of the panel? Is the panel, is it a live panel? How many people, et cetera? It's really um, up to you um, because um, it, what we've seen in the past is some teachers have, um, you know, I, I'll use um, E3 Civic High as an example. <laughs> they had uh, out external judges, um, you know, um, to, you know, they did it through a Zoom session. And so the students would pitch and then the judges would um, create, I mean, fill out a form um, that they could, you know, answer and provide feedback for the students. Uh, you know, most teachers, I guess most schools are, you know, not in in you know actually in person right now um you know of course if it was in person you could have you know judges out come in to the classroom um but uh you know really it, it could look in, in several ways but um but really if you want other teachers if you have your home and school you know leaders who might be interested parents uh you know or you know, or like professionals in, you know, the, the different areas of, in regards to like the SDGs, you could, you know, bring them in as well. But we do have a pitch rubric already put in place, so it makes it pretty easy for them to, to complete. Thank yeah, you. I want to go back and say one thing too, when somebody asks about ambassadors, um, I will point out we have some folks here and, and Stephen Cerruti is one of them from E3 Civic and I see David Conover and Ruben Hoffman. We've got some repeat friends here um, who they themselves are well versed in this and actually quite frankly there may be opportunities and they may have some suggestions about students who could maybe be mentors or provide something afterward. I, I do think this is a good conversation to, to to push into the community to kind of get feedback from each other and see what that could look like. We would love to see that evolve. And then to answer your, um, Alex, uh, is there something you can speak to? We're happy to set time, happy, you can send me an email. I, Alina and I or Lynn would be happy to set up one-on-one -on -one time with you. You may also benefit from getting advice and comments from others in this group, but if you'd like to do that, um, I can follow up with you separately. We can find some time and just chat. And I, I see Stephen um, commented, you know, if you post in the community, that's what the community is there for. Any questions that you have, you know, we can support you there. But we can totally set aside time if you need, for sure. <laughs> that's always an option. Well, so may I just ask, the, the structure is that students in the same class form groups that are basically competing with each other. Uh, and in the end, one pitch from each class gets submitted to the full contest? Is that the structure? So the structure, that's a great question. We tweaked it a little bit this year. Um, we adjusted the structures. Yes, you will work with your students and work with teams and help them through the process. Ultimately, you will conduct an in-class, that might be for lots of different ways, an in-class pitch competition to help select the winningest teams. From that list, depending on how many student teams you have participating, you may be able to submit more than one for consideration in our prizes. So it's kind of a multi-step process. We'll get to all of that throughout the, but that's the gist of what we're headed toward is that they will work, they'll work in teams to identify a problem, ideate, prototype, create a solution, and then pitch it. Um, pitch it internally within your, your classrooms or your schools, and then ultimately uh, share it with us for consideration for our prizes. And, and with that, in the interest of time, I just want to be respectful to everybody. We are out of time here, but we are never done. We are not far away from you. Um, thank you, thank you for joining us today. Please consider sharing this with others who may be interested in joining us. You're gonna receive a follow-up information from us now. And I can't wait to see you again in January. Um, if there's anything we can do along the way, feel free to reach out to us here or the community 
uh, email, whatever works best for you. Yes, thank you so much. And Toby, as I saw there was a quick question, just so you know, um, for now, we there isn't a, um, we don't separate middle school and high school. I just wanted to answer that real fast. <laughs> thank thank you, you, everyone. <laughs>